I want to say good morning to all of you, and thank you for being a part of our worship experience here at Pleasant View Treaty United Methodist Church. Uh, this is our uh, fresh start contemporary worship service that we do at 11 o'clock. Um, we're glad that you're here. We have some who are here in person, and we have others who are connecting with us uh, through our Facebook Live format. And um, I want to remind you, if you're connecting with us on Facebook Live, there's a button there you can click on that says Host Watch Party, and that lets you move this service over to your timeline where you can share with your friends. And a great outreach and a great witness for our church if you share your worship and that you're in worship and where you worship. I uh, just didn't think that's just something wonderful that Facebook has given us. So uh, let's use that if you want to. Make sure you check in and say hi to folks and let us know that we're that you're there. And also those of us here, you can still do the holy high five across the aisle if you want to or whatever. And let people know that you're glad that they're here. Don't just ignore each other. You know, we're together. We are truly one in worship today. And we're going to be blessed in many ways. I hope you came ready for this because I think in some ways we walk into some of these Sundays and we think it's just another Sunday, get through it. And God doesn't look like, like that at all. He looks at it like, okay, I got another shot. <laughs> and I'm going to bless the socks off of somebody. And He brings it to us. And today I think He's got that in store for you. Um, I want to remind you that we've been doing some Sundays where we talked about um, the, the life of discipleship that we have. And uh, a few weeks ago we talked about how God knows the wind of our relationship with him. He knows exactly when we need it the most. And then we talked about the fact that he knows he has a why that's behind everything he does. And that why is his love for each of us. Today, we're going to talk about the how. The how of our discipleship in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the worship that we're going to share. I want to ask you to join me in a word of prayer as we begin the service together. And then uh, let's tune our hearts and spirits to God as we worship and praise and also make ourselves available for his gift and blessing for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for all those who are attending, not just in presence, but in spirit. I thank you for those who are lighting their Christ candle at home at this very hour and welcoming you into their midst. I thank you for the ways we have lit our candles here in our sanctuary this morning and we've gathered again. May we feel that connection as one in spirit today in our worship, in our singing, in our praise, and in our gift of receiving from you. I pray, God, that you leave us different than the way we came, that you shake us up a little bit and make us new and fresh as we claim it to be a fresh start in our lives, God, that you will make that true for everyone in this room today and all those who connect with us um, over the internet. Lord, let us not be the same people that we were, but let us live differently because of you. Thank you for the gift still to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand if you're here, and if you can stand on the sofa, coffee table, whatever you need to at home, let's get jiggy with it and worship God. Get what? Put your hands together this morning. I want to hear y'all sing. Jiggy.
And let's lean upon the gift of God's presence right now. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, I thank you for all those who are in this worship experience today, from the children to the elderly that I see here in our presence, and for those that are connected with us. God, you have a range of lives and experiences that you have brought together. And it's by your design, Lord, that we come together as a people who have varied needs in our life and experience. We know that there are some among us who are hurting, and we know that there are others among us who have a witness and a joy that needs to be shared. And I pray that you will bring them together to speak to the truth of how you work and live in our lives. Just as we said a while ago, we know that the disciples were called together for this time of prayer. And Jesus directed them with the word Father when he gave them the spirit that says God is the Father of all of us. And through him, we are finding ourselves united by one God, one Father. But in the same moment, we embrace the truth that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. How can we not pray together? How can we not do this experience together when it's the same God we serve and the same family of God that we love? And God, I ask today that you will speak to the needs of our hearts and lives, but that you will also reveal to us the things that have been hidden. Show us again the joys of being your child. Show us again the joys of having a church where we see and know the ministries to children and youth and older adults that speak to the ways that we can be active in your world and make a difference. And help us to reach beyond our walls and to our world as well and witness the ways of Christ as he becomes the hands and the feet that serve and lead and welcome others into the kingdom. And God, I ask that you would help us to fill that void in our lives that we feel when we lose a loved one or we find ourselves up against the wall with challenges that we can't do on our own. There are some in our midst today that are facing financial struggles. There are some who are facing loneliness. There are some who are fighting depression and anxiety and worry over our future. We feel like we're out of control in some moments. But God, we're drawn again to you where we find the truth that you are the God in control. And I pray today that you make yourself revealed and known and that you show again the abundant love that will walk us through. Speak to us honestly today about the ways of your love and grace that is always sufficient for our need. Let us hold one another and love one another with more than words, but with a spirit that says we are one. We pray this prayer in the spirit of Jesus Christ, knowing that as he taught his disciples, he gave them the words of the spirit that made them a people united in one gathering of love for you. And his words now speak to us of what we share in common. For you are our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, um, we are at a point where our children and our youth who have been working, uh, rehearsing, coming together, are, are going to make a special musical offering in this time as well as they're sharing in worship. And I want you to know that it's in their heart because of the ways that Cheryl in particular was active with a lot of these children and youth that were before you, that they want to do this as a tribute to her. It's not just about her, it's about God. And it's about the ways that God can use her life and our lives to make a difference in the future of our church. Be blessed today as you listen to these young people share and sing and witness for you.
I love the truth in that song of how we need God, and it helps me remember I needed my glasses. <laughs> you know, uh, Scripture speaks to our lives in so many ways, and Paul, when he wrote the book of Romans, it was one of his first major letters put together to help those who were in the early church begin to define their faith. And it's one of those documents that you can read over and over, and you find so much theology in what he's saying to us, it takes a while to break it down and figure it out. And sometimes he's pretty bold with it, the way he puts things. Today we're looking at Romans chapter 6, beginning with the 12th verse. And here are these words that Paul is saying to the early church. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to, and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Put on your seatbelts.
So I just, you know, we all want to do it. We all enjoy it so much. I hope you felt blessed by that. Um, and we just need to join in at one moment here. Let's just go ahead. <laughs> you know you wanted to. When Paul is sharing in this passage, he's pointing us back into that direction that will make us better disciples, better, better in following this life and relationship we claim with Jesus Christ. And he's pushing us to a place that's a little bit uncomfortable for some of us because he's point blank putting it on the table about the tension that we have between this life of sin and this life of righteousness. And we don't want to we don't want to hit on the nerves of that sometimes. We want to steer around it as much as we can. But I can't think of a better passage to kind of embrace today and to walk us forward a little bit. You know, next week you're going to be uh, making your plans probably already, but next weekend you'll be celebrating your freedoms, right? You'll be celebrating that independence that you have. And, and the good news here is that when we talk about our independence faithfully, it spells a little differently for us. Because in that independence, we discover that by faith, what real independence is, is a dependence on God. I give my freedom up. I don't just claim it. I don't, don't, don't just want freedom. I want to use my freedom in a way that makes a difference. And let me come back to that in just a moment, but I want to remind you again, we've been on a journey already where we've been talking about the fact that God knows your win. He knows the moment that you are needing his salvation, his grace. Paul put it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for an invitation. He didn't wait for you or me to get it right. He decided that that time would be when he knew that you and I needed it the most. And he's ongoing with that. Even today, God knows your win. And he knows when you need his grace. He knows when you need his forgiveness. He knows when you need to be reminded of his love. God knows your win. That's a wonderful part to this life of discipleship that you and I have. Another piece to our discipleship is the fact that God knows the why. The why is not about us. It's again about him. It's the ways that he loves. God loves us. He loves you and he loves me. Far beyond our understanding, God is loving us. And that's his why. The why of his win is the fact that he loved you enough from the very beginning when he made you that he had a plan, he had a purpose, and he had a vision. As a matter of fact, in scriptures we find that when God created us, he made us in his image, and as is told, he then breathed into us this breath of life. He invested himself. And he signed and, and put his name upon each of us in our baptism, we claim that we are the child of God. And God is claiming us as one who is worthy of his love, even before we even know who God is. So from the very beginning, God's why has been his love for you, his relentless love for you. Today, Paul points us in another direction of our Christian understanding, which is that God has a how. He has a how he wants to bring to your life this understanding of his when and his why, and he wants us to know the how. And here's the good news that we see in this, is that so often we tend to think the how is us, when it's really God. <laughs> but the path is not an easy one. What I've discovered in my life, again, is that along the way that I've claimed certain freedoms and liberties in my life, along with it has come certain responsibilities that have challenged me to give something up. Um, I was just having this conversation the other day with someone about how, you know, when you begin a job and you start to work and you're subject to someone who tells you the hours that you work and, and when you have to report and you don't get to pick the days you want off, you get told when your days off will be and when your time off will be. And it changes your whole social life, doesn't it? Because then all your friends are saying, we're going to meet and do this here. And you have to say things like, I got to work. 
life changes. It's reordered in that because in that liberty of being able to make money and do all these other things that I want to do with money in my life, I have to take on the responsibility of living a life where I'm committed to the path of working and earning that money that I receive. I remember when I was younger, I couldn't wait to get old enough to drive a car. And when I turned 16, my stepdad walked me out the back door and pointed to this broke down car sitting in a field with grass growing out of it. And he said, son, that's your car. <laughs> but along with it came a lot of responsibility. That car was never going to run unless I worked on it. And I could never afford to work on it until I could earn the parts to fix it. And so I had to mow yards to earn the money to fix the car so that I could drive. I had the freedom to drive because I was 16 and had my license. But I had to work my way into where that freedom would lead me. And what it led me to was a disciplined life of mowing yards. <laughs> and later on, working a job to pay for insurance. And later on, it goes on and on. And friends, I have to tell you this, young people, listen in. With every freedom will come a responsibility. And along the way of earning that freedom, you're going to have to give something up. And it's the same with our Christian discipleship. We live a life in which we want this freedom in Christ, and it's made available to us because of the when and the why. God's taking care of everything you need to be free from sin. Run, devil, run. Yes. woo -hoo. I'm going to be doing that all week. So if you hear me in the hallway saying, woo-hoo, you know I'm chasing the devil, all right? So we got this point where we know that freedom is there. God's made it available, not waiting on you. It's when you want to claim it. When you want to be forgiven, God will forgive. When you want to choose this freedom in Christ, it's right there available for you. But when you do choose that freedom, be prepared for the responsibility that's going to come right with it. In uh, that era of our nation and other nations in our world of World War II, there was a period where there was a lot of conversation going on about the roles of the church in that process. A great theologian and writer and author and preacher who was in Germany at the time was one named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually himself ended up being moved into a concentration camp and he died there. Shortly before the freedom that was to come when he was to be released, he not knowing that, he gave himself fully to the process. He, did, he refused to leave the nation of Germany whenever others were trying to get all the leaders out, all the great minds and speakers and preachers that were all being pushed to, to leave and move to a safer place, and he chose to stay. His conviction was is that this is not a time for the church to be silent. And he knew that that came with a cause. And he wrote a wonderful book. If you've never uh, had the chance to read it, I want to encourage you at some point to read, read it, break it down, follow it, and see how his thinking works here. But he leads us into an understanding that with our discipleship comes a cost. And he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, reminding us that being faithful to God is going to come at an expense of giving ourselves up. The very God who is freeing you from sin is calling to you a, a life uh, of giving up for him and for his sake, to follow his will, to do his will. We pray the prayer over and over again. Not my will, but your will be done is the words of Jesus, but we say to the forms of, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's will to be manifested, but are we really committed to that? Because in that, you and I don't get to have it the way we want. I think of how many times the church has stood on the cusp of something great. And we as a people dream the dream and we see the vision and we get that hope and that excitement about what we can do to change our world, change lives and make disciples. And then we pause and say something like, well, how much is it going to cost? And how many volunteers do we need? And how are we going to do this again? Let's develop a plan. And we form communities. And the next thing we know, we start weighing the costs as to whether we can do it. In Christian discipleship, we are welcomed into a life that is truly free, but with it comes this cost of giving everything up. 
How many times have you began your day with the words, Lord, not my will, but yours today. And whatever you want, wherever you need me, that's what I'm going to do. We may, we may make those words from time to time, but I think God knows deep in our being that we're really doing it with some resistance in the same moment. You remember a guy named Noah. I'm sorry, you remember a guy named Moses, don't you? And Moses was passionate about the people of God. Exile himself, his one devotion to God was that, that constant request of God. God, you've got to save your people. You need to hear their cry. You need to respond to them, show them that there's a better way than the life that they're living now. They're suffering for your sake. And God finally calls them to a place where there is a burning bush. And he tells Moses, you're on holy ground. You're here in my presence. And he says to, to Moses, look, I have a plan. I've heard the cry. I'm going to respond to your requests. And we're going to take care of this. And Moses is like, yes, Lord. And then, Moses, then God said, and Moses, I need you to go and speak to Pharaoh. And Moses responds, are you sure you want, want me in this? Yes. Because, I mean, there's one other people that could do this better than me. I mean, you know, I'm okay here right now where I'm at. I'll pray for them. But you don't need me to, you don't know. Listen, I got a history with the Pharaoh. I don't, you know. And God is relentless in telling him, you've got to trust me. You've got to let go and trust me. You've got to rely on me. Let me lead. Stop questioning. Trust me. Moses comes back. Lord, I, you know, I can't get the words right. You know me. I'm tongue-tied. I stumble. I'm, I'm, you know, and God says, I got an answer for that. I'm sending someone with you who's going to be a voice with you and give you that confidence you need. But I still need you. Slowly but surely, God made Moses aware. I need you to give up the very freedom you have so that others may be brought into this freedom experience as well. I need you to be willing to sell out for me and trust me to handle it. I don't know about you, but I have trouble with that sometimes in my life. There are moments when I want to trust somebody, but then I want to tell them how to do it. Or I want to go along behind them and see if they can get it right. You know, it's those times when you say, okay, look, this is your job. And then you keep coming back and saying, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you try this? Pretty soon they're looking at me and going, Richard, either you're going to let me do it or you're going to do it for me. And I realize I'm crossing that boundary. I'm taking away from them their freedom to give up for this sake, for this purpose. God knows that about us. And Paul is speaking to the church here, and he's saying, folks, if God knows your when and God knows your why, God knows your how. And it's not by your design. So what do we do with that? We look at the scripture and we see him telling us that we are freed from sin, but we're free from so that we can be freed for. You hear me? We're not just freed from in Jesus Christ. We're freed for. God has things he wants to do with your life. God has things that he wants to accomplish with every child made of his hand and Forgiven by his grace. He wants to create a ministry, a witness in you. Sometimes we struggle with that. But when we find it, then we quit trying to run it and manage it and we just let God do it. You know, it's not an easy decision for us to do that. And I know I'm talking to a lot of people who are in a life relationship with Jesus Christ right now. Either it's in the form of developing for you, or you've been establishing it for a while now. But I want to tell you something. There's always going to be a place for you and I to hear this particular message today and discover that the how that God has for you and me is going to involve you and me giving up a little bit more for his sake. Letting go of the control. Trusting God. I was sharing with uh, Bud earlier uh, today in a conversation we were talking about management and how you kind of move through that. And I shared with him that I was on a retreat once with a, a workshop that was being done for contemporary worship. And the pastor there was the head of a large church that had grown out of nowhere. 
and it was all kinds of forms of varieties of uh, contemporary worship taking place, and the church was reaching and growing leaps and bounds, and he sat down with the pastors to answer their questions of how this happens. You know, what do I have to do as a pastor to become a church like this? I want to see churches grow like this. And the wisdom that he imparted to us was something along this line. When it comes to the worship experiences, I come, I listen to God about the scripture and the message, and I bring it to my team, and I hand it off to my team well in advance of when the worship service is going to take place. And he said, and then they go. And I have no idea for sure what's going to happen on Sunday morning. They might come back and ask a question. They might know this, you know, but he said on Sunday morning, there's always an element of surprise because somewhere along the way, God is taking what we vision and he's magnified it through other people. He said, I'll never forget, it was the Easter morning when you know the message and you know the sermon. And I walked into one of my worship services, my Bible in hand, my sermon in my head, and I looked up and I saw a giant Easter egg sitting on the altar. And I stopped in my tracks and I thought, what am I going to do with a giant Easter egg? Where, who got this idea? He said, I would have never done that. I would have never visioned that. I would have never made that a part of the worship experience. And yet there it was. And he said, I've got to tell you today, by the time that service was over, my focus, God's work was done. And it was far beyond anything I imagined how God would use an Easter egg on an altar. And he said, but I would have never experienced it if I did everything myself. So pastors, let your church work. Pastors, put it out there and let God work. Because he's going to change things. He's going to make it new and different. Now, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but I'm saying this to myself as well. I want you to understand, in your personal life, Salvation and guaranteeing your heart and soul, making it to heaven is not all there is. There's a whole other page to this that Paul wants us to see. You give it up for God. You give your life to God. And God will do some things that will amaze you and astound you. And you will see the kingdom come that you're praying for. Now, we're not perfect people. It's an ongoing experience. God is always doing his, uh, his win for me. God's always going to do his why for me. And he has to keep telling me what the how is. Every day he has to tell me what the next steps are. When I anticipate, I'm wrong. When I try to decide for him and suggest to him, he lets me know. That wasn't me, that was you. <laughs> Just listen to me now. I want to tell you my experience in my life personally where I knew, I know that this is true and I know that this is true for all of us. And it's in my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I took a journey in my life as a, as a teenager uh, where God presented me with people in my life that were agreeing me and nurturing me into the Christian faith. I joke about it all the time, but, and Melody knows the story, but you know, when I was um, a young man, I mowed yards, like I mentioned, to someday have this car. That was how I bought clothes for school and everything. And one of the yards that I mowed was the United Methodist Church's yard in the parsonage next door. And uh, I got a call that the church parsonage and the, the church itself needed to be mowed this week on this day. So I rescheduled things, I made sure I was there, and I was mowing the parsonage, and I finished it, and I moved over, started mowing the churchyard when this car pulls up in the driveway. Oh, they're getting a new pastor at this church. That's what's going on. The car door opens up and this guy gets out, got these glasses and his hair parted down the middle. And I'm thinking, that must be the new preacher. A lady gets out of the side of the car and she's got her hair done. She looks nice and everything. And I'm thinking, that's the preacher's wife. As I'm mowing, then the back door opens up and a little young lady gets out about my age. And she's pretty. Amen. And I start thinking, <laughs> <laughs> I start thinking to myself, you know, I didn't think about the pastor having a daughter. And I continue to mow, and I'm trying not to look, but I'm paying attention. 
And as I'm mowing, I begin to have this conversation with God. You know, Lord, I probably should be going to church more. <laughs> I haven't been going as often as I should. I don't even have a relationship to a church. I'm, I'm thinking maybe, I love this Methodist church here. I mean, it's pretty nice. And I started going to that Methodist church because of a pretty girl. I almost confess it now. And God slowly showed me that it was much more than that. That he wanted me to meet her father. He yes. wanted me to hear a witness and a testimony to what he believed. Yes. And what he did is he believed in me. And he groomed me and shaped me where I began to hear the words that God wanted to use my life too. And I began to, to be open to that. I started saying, okay, I'll do whatever God wants you to do. And I was, you know, I'd help with communion. I'd lead singing. I'd do whatever. So here we were on a Sunday night at Brownsburg United Methodist Church, sitting on the back row with all the youth like we always do. And we get called down once or twice. And I'm at an age where I don't care because, you know, I like the attention. And we got through the service. I can't tell you today what the sermon was. I can't tell you what the message of the sermon was. I can't remember much, but the invitation was given at the close of the service. And in a small church, what happens is when the invitation is given, you get this. Because we're all going to look and see who's he talking to, right? And who's, who's going to move? I'm, 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 yeah, you meet Jesus over there. I know he's going to Somebody better move here. But you didn't know. You didn't know. But you always were looking around, weren't you? And that night, we started singing a familiar song. And the words came right back at me. As soon as I started singing, oh, I know this one. I surrender surrender all all to Jesus I surrender I surrender all and those words began to hit me hard I've been going through a lot of emotions but I hadn't reached a point in my life that I really was just saying God whatever you want And, and I can take the truth that I see in Dietrich Bonhoeffer saying there's got to be a cost to this discipleship. You can't just accept what God has to offer and not understand that he's going to take something from you and make you even more. And I began to struggle in my own life in the point that as much as I was giving God lip service, I needed to really own those words. And a transformation took place where I found myself wanting to be vulnerable enough to say, I surrender all. I pray that God's how will lead you to a place to acknowledge that God needs from you the very thing that will make the next step in your Christian walk. The very thing that will give you more than you've ever seen and be able to accomplish more than you could ever do on your own. Give it to him. Run, never run. And I'm going to run to Jesus. And I'm going to put myself at his feet. I'm going to say, Lord, whatever you want. Think in your life right now about the people that you value and know to be the Christian disciple that you want to be. My guess is what you'll witness in that life is a release to God a trusting God, a surrendering to God that's allowing him to be the very person that you admire. My belief is, is that today, we can stand here today and finish this worship service and close it down, but the truth is it won't make a difference for us until we accept the, the how that Jesus has in our life today. The how will be in your giving for his will what he wants to do next for you. So I'm going to invite you to, to hear this invitation that's coming to you now. As the praise team comes up and takes their place, we're in a moment where we want to consider the ways that the word that I'm sharing today is not just my words. By the way, I've preached some good sermons, but if you just heard me today, you haven't heard the real message that's there. And my prayer always is that God will speak through me, but that his message becomes even more clear. And that there's room for the Spirit to speak to you.
And maybe today the Spirit is speaking to you and reminding you what you still need to give up to make the relationship become more. So let's face that moment of surrender that we need right now, wherever we are and whatever the case may be. Let's stand and let's sing together and consider the ways that God would use you to find the real freedom of being a slave to Christ. Thank mm-hmm. you. 